This lecture is about half-life. Before we talk about half-life, I want to remind you that when we're talking about nuclear radiation, nuclear radiation is random, which means it can't be predicted which nucleus in a radioactive substance will decay. Even if we were able to rewind the entire universe and observe it again, it's possible that a different atom in the material would decay. And it's also spontaneous, which means it cannot be predicted when a nucleus will decay. It could be very shortly after we start the time, but if we rewind the universe and observe the exact same thing again, the exact same process could take a much longer time. This is an issue for us because we need some way of predicting how radioactive substances will behave, but they're fundamentally random. To understand random processes like radioactive material, we use an idea called the law of large numbers, which says if you repeat a trial a very large number of times, the fraction of each possible result will be close to the probability of that result for each individual trial. I'll give you two examples of what I mean. Let's say that we have a coin where one side is red and the other side is blue. This means that the probability of flipping the coin and have the red side land facing up is 50%. This makes it impossible for us to predict, if we flip the coin, which side will come up next. Right now I have no idea what the next side will be. Here I could say, oh, I've had two reds in a row, so maybe the odds are higher that the next one will be blue. But that's not actually true. Every single time we flip it, it's 50-50, so we're just as likely to get red on the next time as any previous times. So it's totally random, and on an individual level, we can't predict what the coin will be for any one trial. And this is kind of like our situation with individual radioactive atoms. However, if we flip the coin a very, very, very large number of times, the odds are extremely high that if we then found the percentage of how many times it came up red and how many times it came up blue, would be about 50% for each. About 50% of the flips would be red and about 50% of the flips would be blue. The odds of that happening for very large numbers are very high, and they become even larger the more times we flip it. So this is what the law of large numbers is telling us. It's telling us that the fraction of each possible result, the fraction of red results and blue results, will be very close to the probability of those results. So the probability of red is 50%, and if you flip the coin, say, a million times, the odds are very good that about 50% of those flips will be red, and about 50% will be blue. This is a way that we can still make predictions about fundamentally random events. Similarly, the odds of rolling any one number on a die are exactly 1 in 6. And so what this means is that if you took a single die and rolled it a million times, and then organized the results, you would find that each individual result occurred about 1 sixth of the time. You would get the die landing on 1 about 1 sixth of those total million rolls. So again, you can see that the fraction of the results with that number is equal to the fraction of the probability of that number if we repeat an event a very large number of times. So luckily for humans, there are a very large number of atoms in a sample of a radioactive substance. So even though we can't predict when an individual atom will decay, we can still use the law of large numbers to predict how long it will take for large amounts of atoms to decay. And this is where we get to the idea of half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for exactly one half of a radioactive sample to decay. Samples of the same isotope always have the same half-life, regardless of how much of the sample is physically present. We use the variable lowercase t with a subscript of one half to symbolize half-life, and we can use any unit of time to measure it. This is a visualization of what half-life means. Mercury-210 has a half-life of 10 minutes, and it decays into thallium-210. So I'm going to symbolize mercury with green and thallium in blue. This rectangle will symbolize how much mercury and thallium I have. It's all green right now, so that means it's all mercury and hasn't decayed to thallium yet. And I'll imagine that this is 64 kilograms of mercury. So we're starting with 64 kilograms. There's no thallium present yet, and no time has passed. If mercury-210 has a half-life of 10 minutes, that means that after 10 minutes pass, half of the mercury will have decayed into thallium. So at the 10-minute mark, I only have 32 kilograms of mercury left. 32 kilograms are now thallium. 10 minutes have passed, and one half-life has passed. So the half-life is always how long it takes for half of the sample to decay. So if I allow another 10 minutes to pass, half of the remaining sample is going to decay. So now after 20 minutes, I only have 16 kilograms because that's half of 32, which means 48 kilograms are now thallium. So two half-lives have passed. This is using the law of large numbers because mercury having a half-life of 10 minutes means that the probability of any one atom of mercury decaying into thallium in 10 minutes is one half. So for any individual atom, we can't meaningfully predict whether it will decay or not, but for very large numbers of atoms, we know that one half of the atoms that we have will decay. And we can keep going and letting time pass. After another 10 minutes, another half of the sample will decay. So we're now left with eight kilograms. And if we do that again, 
we're now left with 4 and 60 kilograms of thallium. And we could just go on like this indefinitely and continue to allow more half-lives to pass. Before we go on, I just want to alert you to a common mistake students make when they're first learning this. Some students will look at this situation and say, okay, if we have 64 kilograms of mercury and the half-life is 10 minutes, after 10 minutes pass, half of it will decay. And after the next 10 minutes, the other half will decay. And so now there's none left. But this is incorrect. This is not what happens. It's always 50% of whatever's left over. It's always half of whatever's left over after those 10 minutes. So it keeps dividing in half and dividing in half and dividing in half over and over again. So it's not the case that the material completely disappears after two half-lives. Another thing you'll notice is that it doesn't matter how much mass we start with. If the substance has a half-life of 10 minutes, after 10 minutes pass, it's always going to have half of whatever that starting substance was. So here I started from two kilograms and you can see these values are very different from my other equation. And you can see these masses are very different from when I started with 64, but the same thing is happening. After every 10 minutes, we have half of the mercury that we had before, and the rest has become thallium. This equation is actually not given in your IB physics data booklet, so I'm not going to talk about it too much, but this is the general equation that describes half-life. The final amount of a substance is equal to the original amount multiplied by one half raised to the power of the time passed over the half-life of the object. That exponent is equal to the number of half-lives that have passed. So if I use the numbers that I had in my first example, you can see that each one individually fits this equation. So this is an intuition for why that equation works. But you're not expected to memorize that. You're just expected to memorize the basic definition of half-life. So again, this equation is not actually given in the IB Physics Data Booklet, and we'll use a simpler method for solving half-life problems. Just a few more notes. Most half-life questions ask about how much activity of the sample remains after a certain amount of time has passed. This is another way of saying the radioactive isotope, since the isotope is decaying to a different isotope that is less radioactive or less active. The unit of radioactivity is one becquerel, or one radioactive decay per second. We write the unit as BQ in problems. The fact that radioactive substances have half-lives causes specific patterns to show up on mass time graphs, where we graph the mass of a radioactive isotope on the y-axis and the time that has passed on the x-axis. So as an example, when no half-lives have passed, the original mass of the object is present. After one half-life has passed, exactly half of the mass remains. And after another half-life, half of that mass is present. And so we keep going up one half-life at a time on the x-axis, and cutting the y-axis value in half to fill out the rest of the graph. And if I draw a line through it, this is what it looks like for the original isotope. And because the daughter isotope, the thing that the original isotope is decaying into, gets its mass from the original, the daughter isotope graph is going to look like this. So the sum of the original plus the daughter isotope should be close to the original mass. So this pattern basically always appears for radioactive substances if you graph their mass or activity on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. I'll finish with a few word problems and a graph problem. A radioisotope has an activity of 400 BQ and a half-life of 8 days. What is the activity of the sample after 32 days? I don't need to use that complicated equation that I talked about earlier. I can just say we start with 400, and after one half-life passed we're at 200, and then after another half-life, we're at 100, and after another, we're at 50, and after another, we're at 25. So I can see at this point, 32 days in total have passed. So that means that my answer is 25 BQ, four half-lives have passed. In example of problem two, a freshly prepared sample contains four grams of iodine-131. After 24 days, 0.5 grams of iodine-131 remain. What is the best estimate for the half-life of iodine-131? So if we start with this sample, after one half-life of the sample passes, it's going to be at 2 grams, and after another half-life passes, it will be at 1 gram, and finally it'll be at 0.5 grams after 3. So I know 24 days is equal to 3 half-lives of this material, so one half-life must be equal to 8 days. So that would be my answer to the problem. Example 3 is a little more complicated. Two pure samples of radioactive nucleides X and Y have the same initial number of atoms. The half-life of X is capital T subscript 1 half. After a time equal to four half-lives of x, the ratio of the number of atoms of x over the number of atoms of y is 1 over 8. What is the half-life of y? For any complicated physics problem, I don't want to overthink it. I just want to write down everything that I know. 
I'm going to call capital N subscript O the initial amount of atoms of each substance. So I know that the initial amount of X is equal to the initial amount of Y. And I know that four half-lives have passed for X. So the final amount of X, which I'll call N subscript F, is equal to the original amount times four half-lives. So that's one half times one half times one half times one half, which is equal to one sixteenth. And I know that the original amount of X is also the original amount of Y. So I can set that equal to 1 16th times the original amount of y. I know that the final amount of x over the final amount of y is 1 over 8. Rearranging that equation, I find that the final amount of y is 8 times that of x. And I know that the final amount of x is equal to 1 16th times the original of y. And I find that the final amount of y is 1 half of the original amount of y. So that means that exactly 1 half of the original has decayed, which means 1 half life of y has passed in this time. And I know that this time is equal to 4 half lives of x, so that means the half-life of y is 4 times the half-life of x. So that's my answer. The half-life of y is 4 times capital T subscript 1 half. We can end with a graph problem. This graph shows the activity of iodine-124. What is the half-life of iodine-124? And calculate the activity of the sample at 20 days. So I can start at the top here, and here the activity is 16. So if I can see how much time it takes to get to exactly half of that activity, I'll know the half-life. And I can see that the time that it takes to get to 8 is 4 days. So that means that the half-life of this substance is 4 days. And if I want to be sure of that, I can just go ahead and say, well, half of 8 is 4, so it should take another 4 days to get from 8 to 4. And that's exactly what happens. And if I do that again from 4 to 2, another 4 days pass, and so on and so on. So that's how you find the half-life from a graph. So to find the activity at 20 days, I just take 16 and 4 days pass to 8. And after one half-life, it's at 8, so 4 days have passed. And then 8 days, 12, 16, 20. So I can see that the final activity will be 0.5, and the unit on the y-axis of the graph is multiplied by 10 to the 7th bq. So my final answer is 0.5 times 10 to the 7th bq, or 5 times 10 to the 6th bq, if I want to write that in correct scientific notation. That's everything that you need to know about radioactive half-life.